Okay. Uh, we have one more minute. Um, All right, uh, welcome everyone to session 3A of Stock 2020. Uh, it's a session on parallel and distributed algorithms and there's a series of uh, uh, four fantastic results. And uh, due to the absence of one of the speakers at this point, we are going to uh, go a little bit out of the order and start with the second talk. And just a reminder to everyone that uh, the talk is, uh, each talk slot is for 10 minutes with five minutes for the presentation uh, with no questions and five minutes for the questions. And you can ask a question by typing in the uh, question and answer box, chat box, or by raising your hand. So uh, let's begin with uh, the talk on uh, directed hop sets by, uh, by Nairon Kao, Jeremy Feynman, and Katina Russell, and Katina will present. Katina, share your screen and start. Okay, thank you. Um, so again, my name is Katina Russell and I'll be talking about efficient construction of directed hop sets and parallel approximate shortest paths. And this is joint work with Nyron Cow and Jeremy Feynman. And so first I'll talk a little bit about what hop sets are. So give just a brief definition and example and then I'll explain our result. So um, a hop set is for a directed graph. Uh, it is a set of weighted edges such that for each pair of nodes UV, there's a path P that goes from U to V that contains at most H hops and the distance of P is at most a one plus epsilon approximation of the distance from U to V in the original graph and no shorter than the distance from U to V in the original graph. And so we consider H to be the hop bound, where H was again the limit on the number of hops on the path P, and the size of the hop set is the number of edges added. So in this little example, um, we've added two edges that are in red, and so the size is two, and the hop bound is three, because you can get from any node to any other node in three hops while still preserving the distance. So now I'll give an example of an inexact hop set. So here we have an unweighted graph and in the graph the path from H to L is four hops and then we construct our hop set. So these are these weighted edges that are shown in red where the weight of each edge is just next to the edge. And so now the path from H to L is just three hops by going from H to I to A to L. But the distance has increased to five. So that's where we get this distance approximation. And so in this example, the hop bound is three because you can get from one node to any other node in the graph while still preserving the distance within one plus epsilon. And the hop set size is four because we've added four edges. So the other part of our result was parallel approximate shortest paths. And so for any low work parallel shortest path algorithm, the amount of work depends highly on the number of hops on the shortest paths. And so through hop sets, we're able to construct a graph where the number of hops on the shortest path is limited. So we can use our parallel algorithm for constructing a hop set to then solve parallel approximate shortest paths. And so once we have the hop set, um, this is not new, Klein and Subramanian did this in 1997. And in the video, I showed a sequential algorithm for constructing a hop set for an unweighted graph. But in the paper, we have a parallel algorithm that also handles the directed case. Okay, so now I'll get into some previous results for hop sets as well as our result. 
So for directed graphs, there already exists an exact hop set with linear size and root n hop bound, but the sequential running time is pretty high and it's m times root n. And this is due to Allman and Yanakakis in 91 and Subramanian and Klein in 97. And so our result is we're able to reduce the work by a lot, getting nearly linear. And so our offset is an approximate offset with nearly linear size, hop bound of n to one half plus a little of one, and our runtime is nearly linear. And so for undirected graphs, a lot more progress has been made and a lot has been known for a while. And so they're able to get much better results, including um, linear size hop set with subpolynomial hop bound. However, the approaches that are used in the undirected case don't really work for the directed case. And also for undirected parallel approximate shortest paths, the papers that are also in this session um, are able to get results, but these techniques again don't apply in the directed setting. So overall, for undirected, the problem has been studied and a lot more is known. And for the directed setting, we're able to greatly reduce the amount of work. And that's all, thank you. Very good, uh, thank you. And uh, questions now? So in that case, uh, let me ask, uh, uh, yeah, so there's a question. One of the questions is uh, from Hang Le. Is there any lower bound for directed hop sets? Um, so there's a lower bound for shortcutting, which is can be applied for directed hop sets. And the lower bound is n to 1 sixth. So there's a bit of a gap between our result, which is n to 1 half plus a little of 1, and n to 1 six when there's a linear number of shortcuts added. Yeah, so uh, uh, so one more question. I, someone says, is your algorithm parallel? I guess, as you said, uh, you described sequential here, but it does, it runs in square root n time, right? Parallel. Yeah, so we do have a parallel algorithm and it has linear work and n to 1 half plus a little of 1 span. Yeah. So but in the question? video, we showed the sequential one. And Julia Chuzai asked, can you say a few words about techniques? Um, yeah, so our paper, the techniques um, are based a little bit on Feynman's paper for parallel reachability and also a follow-up paper by Jungle Lupati, Liu and Sidford for also for parallel reachability. And so basically we have to sample um, a bunch of uh, vertices to search the graph and then use a recursive partition and then recurse on the graph to uh, make progress. Okay. Uh, uh, is there any, uh, okay, Tachapol asked the question, uh, are there any parallel algorithms for directed, I guess, shortest paths uh, not based on hop set? Yeah, so for Parallel approximate shortest paths, the Ullman and Yanakakis and the Subramanian and Klein one are offsets, but there's Spencer's algorithm, which does directed um, parallel shortest paths, and they don't use hopsets. I see. Uh, can you say what they use, or uh, if you remember? Um, they do a sort of path doubling technique. Okay. And their work, though, for having root n span. So they have a trade-off between work and span. And so when they have root n span, their work is something like m plus n squared. So it's much higher. I see. And, and your algorithm is randomized, I assume, because you yes. sampled. Uh, yes. Can you say something about what's known in terms of deterministic uh, algorithms? Uh, the previous algorithms are also randomized because they use a sampling technique. Okay, so in terms of, uh, I mean, is the, for example, path doubling uh, algorithm also based on randomization or is that, uh, that is n square work, I guess, but that is um, also randomized? Uh, that one, I'm not sure. I forget what they do exactly. Okay. 
Uh, any other questions for the attendee from the attendees? Looks like uh, no more questions. Uh, okay. Uh, uh, thank you then. And uh, I'll assume that uh, most of the presenters will be available till the end of the session. And we can uh, ask more questions at the end if uh, people are interested. Uh, I, I guess there's one more question, but we'll take it offline. So now let's uh, see if we can get back to the order of the talks. Uh, Jason and Palin, uh, they both have separate papers on uh, parallel shortest path algorithms in undirected graphs. Jason, uh, if you can share your screen. Jason. Is he here so, now? Yeah, I can hear you. Can you share your screen? Yeah, good. Okay. Um, so okay, this is going. This is uh, the supposed to be the first talk, but we swapped the order. This is uh, talk is based on two papers uh, which are separate uh, on the similar uh, results on the same problem, and uh, uh, it's on pa fast parallel algorithms or approximate shortest paths in undirected graphs. Uh, Jason and Palin Zhong will uh, share the slot. Uh, Jason, take it away. Uh, this, yeah, so uh, this talk will be on faster parallel algorithm for approximate shortest path. Uh, and at the same time, parallel approximate undirected shortest paths via Lukov emulators. Okay, so the problem for this talk will be the approximate single shortest path problem. So given an undirected graph, uh, undirected graph with non negative weights, and a source vertex S, we would output approximate distances from S to every vertex V. Alternatively, we can request uh, uh, an approximate shortest path tree. So the distances between the tree are approximate, approximately the true distances. Um, historically, these problems tend to be of a similar difficulty in a sense that uh, usually an algorithm that can solve one of the two can, is, is able to solve the other one as well. So for in this talk, for simplicity, let's just focus on approximate distances. And in this talk, we'll be considering the parallel PRAM model. So you can think of this as the, essentially the same as a sequential model, but equipped with an extra parallel for each, which will ex execute a set of loops uh, independently and in parallel. And again, again, we can define our work, work and span based on the sum of the running times and the max of the running times, respectively. So past work, um, a well-known uh, breakthrough of Cohen uh, back in the 1990s showed that this problem can essentially be solved in almost optimal work and almost optimal time in the sense that the work is m to the one plus epsilon. Um, this work introduced the concept of hopsets, which are, which are um, edges that shortcut the graph so that uh, for, any, for any given v, the number of edges from S to V in an approximate the shortest path is small. Uh, this polylog factor was approved by Elkin Neiman, but it still remain open whether an M polylog in work and polylog in time parallel algorithm existed. And surprisingly, uh, there's a lower bound that shows that, uh, uh, proved, proved last year, that showed that um, there's no hopset based polylog and work and polylog and time algorithm in the sense that there is a specific lower bound graph such that any hop set with polylogarithmic hop bound on this graph must have super linear or it must have more than m times polylog edges. So therefore, no purely based hop set algorithm can bypass this, this barrier. So our result is that we bypass this barrier and obtain the polylog and m polylog and work and polylog and time algorithm via a new approach via continuous operation. This has seen a lot of re success recently in problems like max flow in, in the sequential setting. Then, similar to max flow, we study a continuous relaxation of the problem. In this case, this is the minimum transshipment problem. And concurrently, um, Andoni, Stein, and Jong have obtained a similar result with similar techniques. In particular, in particular they also uh, 
relax to the minimum transshipment problem. So what is the minimum transshipment problem? Uh, so, so it's also known as uncapacity min cost flow. You, really, you should really think of it as a more of a shortest path problem than a flow problem because of the costs. So the input is, is a graph with, you can think of the graph with an, in matrix notation, a vertex in, edge instance matrix and a demand vector that's that has, whose demand sum is zero. And the constraints in matrix notation will be a flow vector on the edges that satisfy the, the flow constraints. So this is so far is some same as max flow. So the objective here is to minimize the L1 norm when we went weighted by the costs. The L1 norm in the flow when weighted by the costs. So this is similar to max flow in the sense that, different from max flow in the sense that uh, we're, we're considering the L1 norm of the flow, whereas max, whereas max flow considers the L1 infinity. So this, this problem turns out to be reducible. Uh, so why is this problem relevant? Well, it's known how to reduce approximate SSSP to polylog in many calls of approximate transshipment. Uh, this was first shown in by Becker, Forrester, Karenborg, and Lenzen, but, but uh, in a different model. So we have to do some extra work to, mod to adapt their techniques to work in a parallel mode. But this shows that it's sufficient to consider the minimum transshipment problem. Again, this, this reduction is not obvious because transshipment is a more of like an average kind of guarantee. Uh, approximate transshipment is more of an average guarantee, whereas approximate shortest path, we need approximate distance for all S to be. So to, to solve transshipment, we follow Sherman's framework from his original breakthrough paper on Maxwell. So we reduce one plus epsilon approximate transshipment to what we call a polylog and approximate L1 oblivious route scheme. So Sherman reduces uh, 1 plus epsilon approximate max flow to a polylog approximate or approximate uh, just a lip L infinity oblivious routing or also known as just a traditional oblivious routing scheme. So know that, um, so know that oblivious routing is actually a harder problem than transshipment or max flow. But the, here the benefit is that we only need a polylog approximate and, and that is enough to boost the approximation to a one plus epsilon approximate in the slightly easier problem, transshipment or max flow. Okay, yeah, um, I think I'll, I'll stop now, I'll stop here. So the, yeah, so these, those are, these are the rest of my slides and I'll stop here. For now time, sorry. So Palin, you want to take over? Yeah, I, I, I want to share. Um, I want to uh, roughly uh, present my, my result. I will be very short. Okay. Um. Um. Thanks, Jason. Okay. Now, uh, I will uh, present the alternative way to compute parallel approximate stress path by low hope emulators. So our result is to uh, can compute one plus epsilon approximation ST choice pass using uh, low hope emulators and it uh, takes polylogon over epsilon time and near linear work. Uh, we have three states. So in the first stage, we construct a low hope emulator, which is a, a new concept, which is very similar to a hope set, but there's some fundamental difference. And in the second stage, we use continuous optimization technique to solve a more general problem which is the uh, uncompetitive mean cost flow as mentioned as, uh, by Jason. Actually, we'll use the first stage low hope emulator to compute polylog and approximate Charles pass to construct a preconditioner for the second stage uh, continuous optimization. And in the second stage, as mentioned by Jason, we use Sher Sherman's framework to solve uncompetitive mean cost flow up to one plus epsilon approximation. In the third stage, we show how to uh, recover a pass from the flow. Uh, there's a high level picture of our algorithm. So firstly, we develop low hope emulator and we use it to compute a single source shortest path up to polylog and approximation. And then by combining with Borgans embedding, we can embed our original graph to the L1 metric. And then we develop a uh, compressible preconditioner and by combining with L1 embedding, we show how to compute uncompressible mean cost flow up to one plus epsilon approximation. Uh, and then we use 
uh, we develop a uh, recursive path construction technique, uh, and then we show how to compute the uh, one plus epsilon uh, ST shortest path. Uh, the most important ingredient in our algorithm is low hope emulator. So what is low hope emulator? Low hope emulator of a graph G is a sparse graph G prime, such that the distance in G prime is a good approximation of the distance in, in the original graph G. Uh, in, in addition, there's a very crucial property of our low hope emulator. So the hope diameter of the uh, low hope emulator is very slow. So for any exact shortest pass in this uh, low hope emulator, it only contains small number of hops. Uh, here's the main result for our local emulator. We show for any k which is larger than one, uh, at least one, uh, any graph g, there's a local emulator g prime such that the size of g prime is at most n to the one plus one over k, and the distance in g prime is a poly k approximation of the distance in g, and the whole diameter is log k, and we can compute in in, in parallel time poly log n, and the total work is the number of edges plus n to the one plus two over k. In particular, if we choose k to be log n, then this g prime has size near linear, and the uh, distance g prime is a polylog n approximation of the original distance, and the whole diameter is log log n. So we can run Bellman Ford in log log n number runs to compute any uh, shortest path uh, in, uh, in, this, uh, in this graph g prime. And we can compute this g prime in parallel time polylog n, the work is linear, uh, near linear. So this already gives a polylog and approximate single source short pass, and we can compute it in polylog and parallel time and near linear work. Uh, okay, thank you. So uh, the last slide is just the comparison between low hope emulator and hope set. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Berlin. I think it's a good time to stop. We kind of uh, uh, used up uh, the, the, the time. So if there are a couple of quick questions we can answer, now uh, and otherwise we'll take most of the questions for this talk towards the end if that's okay okay yeah. so uh quick questions from the audience so let's see uh, uh, um i think there's a, uh there's a hope so the things that if we can uh if we can improve the approximation of the low hope emulator, and then maybe we can uh, decrease the number of logs in the final algorithm. Um, so so uh, the address. Um, maybe I'll read the question. Uh, Vijay is asking, how do the edges in the G prime? I guess the emulator relate to the edges in G. Okay, so uh, so the the edges in G prime. Uh, may not be the original address in G. So we use the uh, address in G. So we, we use the original graph to compute the new address in G prime. But, uh, but, uh, but we do not need the address in G to be in graph G prime. So it's not a subgraph necessarily, right? The, the G prime edges could be different edges. Right, 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 right. G prime can be different edges. Yeah, it's an emulator, it's not a spanner. Yeah. Okay, I think we'll stop there and take questions. Uh, for uh, uh, Jason and Palin at the end of the session, if that's okay. Uh, okay. And uh, we'll go to the next talk uh, on, uh, uh, by Vashek and Mohsen on uh, distributed algorithms, uh, deterministic distributed algorithms. Uh, very nice result, uh, very elegant technique. Um, can uh, Vashek uh, start his slides, please? Uh, actually, I cannot. So first, oh, I, I uh, think Pelin, you may have. Setting. Yeah. Oh, yes. Okay. Great. Can you see my slide? Yes. Yeah. Good. So hello, Vashek Grozhan is speaking, and this is joint work with Moxen Gafari. And let me let me start right away by giving you one sentence summary of our work. So we proved that the distributed algorithms in the very classical local model of distributed computing, do not need randomness for efficiency. So, so to make sense of this statement, we first need to define this local model of distributed computing. So this is a very classical model in which we study distributed graph algorithms. And in this model, we start with a huge undirected graph on N nodes. And in each node, there is one computer sitting. And these computers, they are communicating in synchronous rounds. And in each round, any computer can send any message to any of its neighbors. We do not bound the size of these messages. 
and we also do not bound the computation that actually happens in this computer. So initially, these nodes know only n, the number of vertices, and in case of deterministic algorithms, also their unique identifier. And in the end, each node should know its part of output. So for example, if we try to solve the maximal independent set problem, then in the end, every node should know whether it is part of that maximal independent set or not. And the measure of time complexity here is very simple. It is just the number of rounds these nodes need to communicate until they get the output. So this is indeed a very simple model. And maximal independent set is actually a very nice example on which I can demonstrate a more general phenomenon. And this is a huge gap in our understanding of deterministic and randomized algorithms. So for a long time, we know a beautiful randomized algorithm of Luby for maximal independent set that runs in O of log n rounds. But the best known deterministic algorithms had much larger complexity. And for the case of maximal independent set, this is a famous question of lineal, whether there is polylog n round deterministic algorithm for this problem. So we answer this question affirmatively. And if you look at our talk, then at the end of it, you will know a simple deterministic polylog n round algorithm for maximal independent set. And it turns out that this in turn leads to even faster randomized algorithms for maximal independent set. But now let me switch gears a bit and let me tell you what is our actual technical contribution. So our contribution is a quite simple deterministic polylog n round local algorithm for a problem that's called network decomposition. And network decomposition is quite a general problem. So as a quick application of this theorem, we are getting the deterministic algorithm for maximal independent set, but actually we are getting much more. And this is what I already alluded to. So if we put it in the framework of Gaffari, Harris and Kuhn, then we are actually getting that all reasonable randomized local algorithms can be de-randomized with polylog and slowdown. And there are more corollaries of this theorem. And these applications are not only in the local model of distributed computing, but also in the related conscious model or even the MPC model of distributed computing. But now let me stop talking about applications and let me finish by telling you what is actually this network decomposition problem. So network decomposition is really just a clustering problem. So somehow this is the picture that you should have in mind. And here I restated our theorem and it is saying that there is a deterministic polylog and round local algorithm for network decomposition with C equal polylog and colors and D equal polylog and diameter. And this is just saying that we have a deterministic algorithm that will cluster the vertices of the graph into clusters such that each of these clusters will have small diameter at most D, which is polylog n. And we can color all of these clusters with C, which is polylog n colors, so that neighboring clusters will have different colors. So that's it, that's the problem that we somehow solve deterministically in polylog and rounds. And now just the very last thing that I will tell you is why you should believe me that this problem is somehow interesting and why you should believe me that we can get easily this applic these applications out of it. So let's say that I want to solve maximal independent set and you give me network decomposition. So how do I solve maximal independent set? Well, I will just iterate over the color classes of my network decomposition. There are just polylog n of them. And then when I fix one color class, for example, the green class, then for each cluster, what I do is that each node of it will collect the whole topology of that cluster and also kind of its immediate neighborhood. And after every node collected the whole topology, I can say, for example, that the node with smallest ID will just compute the maximal independent set for this whole cluster. And it will send this solution to all of the other nodes in that cluster. And actually that's it. So if I give you network decomposition, then you automatically get a polylog and round algorithm, let's say for maximal independent set. But as you see, this approach is really much more general. And this is why we are also getting this, these general applications out of our result. So I tried to compress a lot of information in a few minutes. So let me just finish by telling you somehow the take home message. So our te technical contribution is a simple deterministic polylog and round local algorithm for a problem called network decomposition. And as an application of this algorithm, we are getting that distributed algorithms 
in this local model of computing do not need randomness for efficiency. So that's it for me, and I will be happy to answer your questions. Thank you. A very nice result. Let's uh, see if there are any questions. Any questions from the audience? Yeah, so there's one. Uh, let's see. Um, uh, Karthik Chandrasekharan so is asking lower bounds for the deterministic model. What's known? Okay. So yeah, that's a great question. So I can go, for example, back to maximal independent set. So that's a nice example because right now we already have lower bounds that are saying that our algorithms are somehow first order tight. So for deterministic maximal independent set, we have lower bound log n over log log n. So this is saying that, you know, up to this constant, we are already in the right ballpark. And for randomized uh, maximal independent set, we know that, okay, can you see it? Good. So we know that somehow this, okay, okay this algorithm has dependency O of log delta plus poly log log n. And we know that both this log delta is necessary. So there is lower bound log delta over log log delta. And we also somehow know that this poly log log n is necessary. That is lower bound log log n over triple log of n. So I'm talking actually about this, uh, not in the short talk, but in the comment section of the shorter talk, I have a link to a longer talk where I talk in particular about upper bounds and lower bounds for maximal independent set. But somehow the upshot is that, for example, for maximal independent set, we now actually have first order type somehow understanding of the complexity. Okay. Then there are problems like delta plus one coloring. And there we have somehow similar upper bounds, but all the lower bounds that we have are log star of n. So for some problems, there are, there are still kind of big gaps in our understanding. Thank you. A quick uh, question. Uh, 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 was the network decomposition problem known before by Jacob? Oh, okay, I, I, again, that's a great question. So I, I was here very quick, so I was not talking about the previous work on network decomposition, but it is actually, again, a very classical problem. So for example, here, this 2 to square root of log n, upper bound for maximal independence set by Kampan Konese and Srinivasan, is actually algorithm for network decomposition. So what they did is that they somehow still the best, best known way how we can solve deterministically maximal independent set is to construct network decomposition and then we are automatically done. So Pan Konese and Srinivasan had two to square root of log n uh, algorithm for network decomposition. Uh, network decomposition was defined in the seminal work of Aver et al, where they gave actually almost the same round complexity algorithm. Thank you, Vashik. I think uh, in the interest of uh, getting to the last talk on time, I will uh, suggest that we uh, postpone the rest of the questions to the, uh, to the end. Mm -hmm. okay, so all of you whose questions didn't get answered, please hang on and uh, Vashik should hopefully be there uh, for, for the, the end of the session. Okay, um, can you stop sharing your screen? And uh, the uh, last talk in the session is on uh, uh, walking randomly, massively, and efficiently, and uh, slope down Mitrovich will give the talk. Yes, take it away, slope down. Uh, thank you for thank you for introduction. Uh, my name is Slobodan Mitrovich, and this is a joint work with Jakub Boski, Krzysztof Fonak, and Piotr Sankowski. In our work, we ask the question how to compute random walks, and in particular, how to compute random walks in a small number of parallel sets. Um, we show in the context of MPC, uh, we show how to compute uh, one random walk at each vertex in the graph, all the walks simultaneously and being independent, uh, and walks are of length L. Uh, in log L rounds, uh, we, give, we give an approach that does this in log L rounds for unrated graphs. For the rest of the graphs, uh, it requires log square L many rounds. And we also show how to approximate stage rank uh, in the rated graphs as well in uh, log log N square plus log square one over L on many rounds. But epsilon is its teleportation probability. And for this in MPC, uh, we need the total space, which is slightly uh, super linear uh, in, in the size of the graph and uh, also has four logarithmic independence on L. Uh, just to contrast these two prior work, uh, this uh, essentially gives nearly exponential improvement. Um, well, in the context of theorem, um, uh, essentially we, we show by using, uh, by using the same techniques, uh, we show that uh, uh, there is an RNC 
uh, PRAM algorithm. Uh, such such is as for page rank were not, were not, were not before. Uh, but we, we show that um, uh, one can get Terence algorithm for direct random as well. Um, now for the rest of the talk, I will, um, I will spend time um, going briefly over, over the techniques, over the main steps of our approach. Uh, so in general, in our approach, we start from random walks in under graphs. Then uh, we, from there, we, go, we don't go directly to random walks in direct graphs, but rather we go to computing page rank in direct graphs. And now using page rank as a primitive, we go back to computation of random walks, but this time in direct graphs as well. Okay, so uh, the first um, kind of idea um, or observation is that if you are given a station distribution of random walks that you want to compute, it could be regular, like standard random walks in graphs, it could be a station distribution uh, of, of uh, page rank walks. If you are given pi, uh, then uh, in log L rounds, uh, you, can do it, uh, you can compute these walks, uh, but the space that you, that you need uh, is uh, uh, inversely proportional to the minimum entry of the of this uh, station distribution layer. Okay, uh, so if you look at uh, at, at some um, stand, uh, at some um, long random walks, like standard random walk in undirected graphs, we know the station distribution is lower bound than by one over two m, which immediately implies that the memory requirement for undirected walks would be very nice. Now, when it comes to uh, directed graphs, then uh, the situation is much worse in terms of lower bound on station distribution. And if you plug in, uh, if you use this approach directly, it will require exponential running time. Now, for page rank, again, we get uh, this nice property that uh, station distribution is lower bound and by, uh, by something reasonable uh, in the sense it's epsilon over n, uh, which uh, again implies nice memory requirement. So, we, we, we uh, from, from, uh, from, um, uh, from undirected random walks, we go to a computing page junk, uh, page junk box. And the question is how to compute page junk box? Well, uh, so the result by Bray from 2002 that essentially tells you that uh, page junk appro uh, computation approximates to, uh, uh, boils down to computing n log n short random walks. And when I said short, I mean uh, walks of length log n over epsilon. Now, this is very nice because together with step one, it immediately implies that in undirected graphs, we can actually compute page rank very, very efficiently. Okay, so this is cool. We have now uh, page rank for undirected graphs, but we would like to page rank for directed graphs. And here is what we do. Uh, we define uh, a, a sequence of graphs, uh, GJ, which is a mixture of undirected version of input graph and directed graph. Okay, in particular, if J is equal to zero, this uh, G, G zero would be exactly undirected version of input graph. And if J is equal to log log n, we are getting directed graph. Uh, so that we are something that we, that we want to compute at the end. Um, good, so, um, and then uh, what we essentially do is uh, we start for page rank in G zero, and then uh, progressively, uh, progressively inject more and more directedness. Uh, into, into random walks that they're computing uh, until we uh, eventually get to uh, get to uh, compute page junk in directed graphs. Um, and you might wonder how we actually make one step, how we go from GJ to GJ plus one. So there are two ideas that we use. The first one is when J is large, then it's at least log log n over two. This intuitively means that you already have uh, lots of random, uh, lots of directedness in the random walks that you're computing for, for this GJ. So then we use rejection sampling uh, to simply reject walks that have too little randomness compared to GJ plus one and keep only walks that have sufficient uh, amount of directed edges in them. Uh, but now when J is very, very small, think of J is equal to zero, then this approach doesn't trick because uh, all what you would have is essentially undirected version of the graph. So in that case, and it is very instructive to think, uh, to think about this example to the right. So in that case, it would be thing that actually if you, do, if you take a random undirected edge, that with some, uh, with some uh, non-negligible probability is going to be a directed outgoing edge. And in this example to the right, it's clearly not the case. So what we do in addition to all of this, we transform the graph so that it has this nice property that out degree of each vertex divided by total degree is at least one third. And now together with this transformation, we can apply uh, step C uh, and actually perform this, uh, this gradual uh, transition from GJ to GJ plus one. 
and this excludes computation of paid junk box. And just uh, to conclude with this, uh, with these steps, uh, finally to compute uh, directed uh, to compute directed uh, box uh, regular box. Uh, what we do is we invoke page rank primitive, but for epsilon, which is small, which is one over L. And now one can show that with constant probability, uh, uh, page rank walk is actually going to be uh, a lot of walk in a directed graph as well. That is, it is not going to have any teleportation. And maybe another way to think about, uh, think about this step five is that uh, stationary distribution for, for uh, regular walks in directed graphs give us lots of knowledge, give us about arbitrary long walks. But uh, page rank walks for this setup of epsilon gives us knowledge about walks up for length panel. That is exactly what we need, and this is how we get saved in the map. And by, by this, I will conclude. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you for the nice talk. Uh, let's uh, see if there are any questions for you. Uh, uh, let me see. Uh, uh, Jan Studeni has a question for you. When you transform the graph by adding vertices, the random walk of length L can have different length than in the original graph. Isn't this problematic? Uh, yes, that's, that's a very good question. Yeah, that's, that's a great question. Uh, yes, yeah, so this this is this is exactly this is exactly what happens. Um, so um, um, uh, it is. It, uh, but what we do, uh, we uh, we also reduce epsilon. Uh, so in this in this transform graph, each edge pretty much would be replaced by a part of length log n. And now, if you would uh, if you would reduce epsilon, uh, uh, if you would divide the epsilon uh, teleportation probability by log n. Uh, then uh, we would also get something uh, that responds now to this to this uh, to this uh, uh, transform graph, and this is what we do. Uh, we start with some epsilon, which is a constant, and then we reduce also gradually epsilon to account for this transformation. Yeah, yeah so it's, it's a very good question. Thank you. Uh, any other questions uh, from the audience? Ah, uh, yes, Sefer. Yeah. Uh, do you have any results with uh, memory dependence uh, much less than L, say square root of L? Um, um, not, uh, no, not really. Oh, that's a good question. Not really. Uh, so um, intuitively, um, why in our approach we need uh, we need we need dependence on L. Uh, so even if you think of the amount of of, uh, of random bits that you need uh, that you need for each walk, uh, if you are sending, let's say uh, uh, n walks, um, uh, one per each vertex, then already, uh, but this is only heuristic, uh, uh, heuristic um, uh, argument, you need like n times l many random bits. Uh, so our approach, our approach doesn't try to somehow uh, use, let's say, randomness in, in, a, in a more efficient way. So we need, uh, we have dependence, uh, linear dependence on that. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, any other questions? So maybe uh, uh, what we can do now is uh, stop the recording of the session and uh, let people ask questions to the panelists, uh, to the speakers uh, in an informal way, if uh, everybody is okay with that. Uh, Liren, can you stop recording? And Okay, yeah. Uh,